Good morning. Welcome everyone to the MIF Plus Plus seminar. Today, Daniel Widowson will practice his talk for the IUCR Congress in Melbourne next week. And Dan will talk about resolving the data ambiguity for periodic crystals and detecting near duplicate structures. Over to you, Dan. Okay, yeah. So hopefully it's somewhat relaxed today. It's only a practice talk. So if there are a bit if there are a few bloopers, then uh, it'll be smoothed out next time. But um, okay, here we here we go. So uh, for the first time in a while, I have an introductory slide because I think it actually works quite well. Um, and I've started with um, the IUCR definition of a crystal, which um, I think is intentionally vague or necessarily vague. Um, so uh, just to read it out, a solid is a crystal if its atoms or molecules uh, form on average a long range ordered arrangement, which um, I say is uh, intentionally vague or purposefully vague because crystals are very complicated things. Nature's complicated and, that has, and uh, the idea of a crystal has to capture a lot of things, including disorder. Um, and later on in this, presentation, I'm going to give kind of my own definition of crystal, our definition of crystal. It's not a replacement for this definition, but um, I like putting this here to draw the stark contrast between the very loose nature of that statement and our very precise definition. Um, and I think there are some sacrifices you have to make for our crystal definition, but it's worth it because you get mathematical rigor in return. So. Uh, here we're going to define the idea of a periodic set. This is stuff that probably everyone has seen a million times, but we'll do it. Um, we define this idea of periodic set. We define this uh, idea of isometry and equivalence um, and equivalence relation, which makes this kind of crystal space. And then we give what is essentially coordinates on this space. Um, and there's a little image on the right here, which uh, tries to sort of summarize what we're going to do. So we've got this circle representing all collections of cell and motif pairs. And uh, we see I've got two points on the left here, which um, we know to be the same if you just look at it for a second. Um, the cell and motif pair is different. I've just chosen it slightly differently, but these should be considered the same. And then when we, when we apply this isometry equivalence, they get binned into the same the same class, right? And then I've got two real crystals up here, which um, just at a glance, you, you can't tell whether they're the same or not, but um, the point is our techniques should help you determine if that's the case. So uh, we'll start with periodic set. So uh, mathematically, that is just um, a finite collection of points and the basis of the space or, um, that's a, a unit cell and a motif. So three vectors which aren't degenerate form the unit cell. And then the collection of points, generally we think of them as being inside that unit cell. And uh, you add the finite collection of points to every combination of those, um, of those vectors in the basis. That's the lattice, every combination of basis vectors. And you end up with an infinite set of points. So here, um, I've drawn the vectors in 2D with some points and then it extends to this infinite set of points. I've drawn the lines to help you see where the periodicity is, but that, this is just an infinite set of points. And intrinsically, that infinite set has no um, intrinsic reference to, to the unit cell or motif I chose. I could choose something else, which is part of the problem. So this is uh, our first rigorous definition. So. Um, let's talk about the sort of problem which I've touched on already. It's just that a, a cell and motif definition is ambiguous. I can take any given crystal lattice any, uh, or crystal um, and redefine it in terms of cell and motif by just choosing something else. Um, so in the case up here, uh, this square lattice has a motif inside it. If you extend it, you can just move the unit cell along right and you get a different collection of coordinates inside that unit cell, but it's the same. It's the same object, it's the same crystal, the same periodic set. So this, um, this circle that I introduced at the start with the collection of all 
cell motif pairs um, just isn't appropriate. There are, there are separate points in that space which are supposed to be the same thing. And uh, that's one of the really important things we're gonna have to start to solve. Um, and we tackle it by defining isometry or rigid motion first, we'll introduce that. So two crystals should be considered identical. If you can take one infinite periodic set representing a crystal, and then if we can apply a rigid motion to get something else, that is the same object, right? Rigid motions don't change um, what a crystal is. Um, and the rigid motion, by the way, is a, a combination of translation or rotation. In this work, we talk about isometries, and uh, that's a sort of a concession for, for this particular set of slides. Our group has worked on other things where you can include or exclude the reflection part. Um, but basically, isometries are a really nice class of transformations to work with mathematically. So you get quite a, you, you can, it makes it easier uh, in the future to construct simpler um, coordinates that we're going to make. And those things will be faster to compare. And if you want to just talk about rigid motion, it makes it a bit more difficult. But isometry is how we're gonna consider two crystals equivalent. If you can get one infinite periodic set from the other via an isometry, we're gonna consider them the same. Okay. So let's introduce the idea of an equivalence relation. This is a, this is a mathematical tool used everywhere, but all over mathematics. When you have a collection of objects, but many of those objects should be considered equivalent or the same to each other in some context. What an equivalence relation does is it takes your collection of objects and it splits it into disjoint bins where everything in the same bin is equivalent. And now that bin can be considered an object. So these, um, these statements here, I don't think it's terribly important, but it means that every object has to be equivalent to itself. We're defining here this uh, stim, this uh, tilde, that is uh, some abstract relation. We, we are gonna talk about isometry. So think of this stim meaning isometry. Um, so everything should be equivalent to itself. If something's equivalent to something else, then vice versa. I think that's um, pretty normal for the idea of an equivalence. And then third, most complicatedly, if something's equivalent to a second thing, and the second thing is equivalent to a third thing, then the first and the third thing are, are equivalent to. Um, and these three things are satisfied by our summary. So we have this space of periodic sets, and we've defined the idea of isometry uh, equivalence on it, meaning two things are equivalent if you can get from one to the other with an isometry. And uh, that idea naturally segments the space of periodic sets or motive cell pairs into uh, um, a, a collection of disjoint equivalence classes, we call them. And each equivalence class contains infinitely many sets which uh, can all be obtained from each other with uh, some isometry. And one class is what we call one crystal. Um, and this is a well-defined idea. You can actually just write down the uh, mathematical formalism for this that defines a specific um, uh, crystal here. We're saying crystal, not periodic set. Here, one crystal refers to many periodic sets, which are all equivalent, right? Um, so this slide here uh, is essentially taken as from this, this picture on the right, it's taken as from the top to the bottom. Now, this sort of space is all segmented into these different uh, crystals. And now we're gonna want to start defining um, sensible ideas of a coordinate on, on this, or a parameterization of that space is uh, more accurate to say. So yeah, our contribution isn't the definition of that space, which comes for free, but um, you, you, we want to be able to parameterize it nicely because the, this definition of crystal is quite uh, verbose and uh, not a great representation to use uh, experimentally. So we, we want some rules for our parameterization, our coordinate system. Um, if you don't apply these rules, then you get unusual situations. So here's a, an example of being sensible, which 
um, you might not think of initially is continuity, right? This example below, I have a cubic, uh, simple cubic crystal. You extend the unit cell and move a, move a point. And uh, now you can't reduce the unit cell anymore. You can have uh, pseudo symmetries, but <laughs> they rely on um, tolerances. And as long as you perturb enough, now it becomes a genuinely different crystal. The, the point is that in actual fact, as you move a point, the crystal smoothly deforms, right? It's, it's a smooth change in the periodic set. And that should be reflected by a smooth change in our descriptor or our coordinate. Um, if you have anything that depends on tolerances, I can just construct an example where something falls below the tolerance and then after the tolerance, um, there's, a, there's a discontinuity, right? So we want this continuity. Um, and this is uh, one of the points that will make our coordinates robust. So let's just uh, list, this is a list. And then the next slide, I have a picture trying to explain the list. So um, the first thing is isometry invariance. So the, these coordinates, the input will be a unit cell and a motif. And we've established that you can choose different cell and motifs that um, give the same equivalent periodic set. Isometry invariance means that it doesn't matter both of those uh, different inputs, which are supposed to be equivalent, will get the same coordinate or the same descriptor. So two periodic sets that are isometric get the same um, coordinate. Completeness is the um, converse to that statement. So if I have two periodic sets, which I know are different, you actually can't get from one to the other via an isometry. They definitely have different outputs. This is different than something like a density. Density satisfies the first point. If you have two equivalent crystals, uh, they always have the same density or point density, if you like. We're actually uh, ignoring atomic types for the moment, so maybe point density is better. But uh, anyway, two equivalent things always have the same density, but there are many non-equivalent things with the same density as well. And that's um, not a good thing for a robust, a robust coordinate system on this space we're trying to define. Right? Third is continuity, which um, I've just sort of gone over. As you move around, if, if you take a periodic set and you start moving points around, then that smoothly deforms our uh, descriptor or our invariant. And then four metrics. So we're mathematicians and we like uh, robust mathematical spaces with well-defined things on them. And when a, when a mathematician thinks about distances, we tend to think about a metric, which is just a list of, of simple rules, um, which ensure that your idea of a distance is, is sensible. So one way of comparing crystals is with a PXRD. And this, uh, I'm, I'm not saying that we're to, here to replace PX, PXRD, but one of the things we don't like about it is that it fails this, this idea of the triangle inequality, which I'll show on the, on the next slide. You can have one crystal and another, and the distance between them, or the similarity of measure, um, the distance is actually larger than if you go via a third crystal, which wouldn't make sense in like normal Euclidean space or, or anything else like that. Uh, and it'd be quite nice to have 0.5 as well. We do make some concessions to get 0.5, um, uh, computability. We don't want to spend forever computing these uh, things, or at least um, this particular invariant I'm going to introduce is quite well computable. If you, uh, if you say wanted to talk about rigid motion instead of isometry, then computability becomes a bit more difficult. This is something that we're quite, we're quite good at. Um, but completeness is something that we don't quite get all the way there with. We'll see. So here's a, an image, I hope it's not too noisy, which summarizes the last few points. Um, we have these two points, which uh, I showed earlier, and these are equal, I just, um, yeah, two, two cubic, simple cubic crystals. So this, this point A here is equivalent to this, that's our, our, the uh, invariance part. Then the completeness part, this different crystal B is always gonna be different to, um, the 
any other crystal that's actually different. And then uh, we have, say, three continuity. So if I take A and I perturb it a little bit, there's not much of a change in the coordinate output. And then metric, meaning if I go from A to B, that's the distance from A to B is smaller than going through any third crystal C. So we've defined our isometry equivalents. We've split this space up into these bins. Um, and now we're going to define this coordinate on it. So let's introduce the pointwise distance distribution. So we take any crystal as a cell and motif pair. It doesn't matter which cell or motif you choose. And all we're gonna do is record the environment of each atom in the unit cell by listing distances to its nearest neighbors. It's quite simple, like a RDF style type thing. Um, so each atom here, each symmetrically um, unique atom has its own list of distances to its nearest neighbor. And we don't choose a cutoff radius. We don't restrict it to inside the same unit cell. We, we do stop at some number of neighbors K because this is an infinite periodic crystal and, um, and we have to choose some cutoff, but uh, a large enough K should contain all the information you need. So once you've listed the distances to nearest neighbors for each atom, we put them into this matrix. If any two of the lists are identical, we collapse them and we give them this weight, which is proportional to the number of times that list appeared. Um, and that's going to be important for comparing crystals later. Um, usually lists only collapse if there's symmetry and uh, you're at, you can actually do a, a trick to not have to do everything in the motif, just the asymmetric unit only, right? Um, so once we've got this matrix of collapsed, um, collapsed rows, we just order them, apply a stable ordering so that we get always get the same uh, output for any two input crystals. We don't want it to change if we reorder our atoms arbitrarily, right? And then we end up with this PDD. It's literally a distribution of pointwise distances, which are ordered in a specific way to contain information. So let's just uh, run through some facts of how it, how this work, how this satisfies the list I gave earlier. So. Um, you might be able to figure out in your own head after five minutes of thinking why this is an invariant because we only listed points between uh, distances between points and it's independent of any choice of cell or motive. So it makes sense uh, in terms of those equivalence classes I described. Um, I won't talk too much about earth movers distance, but that is the, uh, that is the function or the uh, classical metric we use to compare these distributions. And it, it's a, uh, it respects those weights we were talking about. So you can take any two PDs with any number of rows and it will try and match them with each other. You get a distance of zero whenever the crystals are the same. Um, and if you perturb a point slightly in a periodic set, then the distance between one and the other is, is very small, even if symmetries break, right? These things are very well, they're, well, they're nicely computable. If you're a computer scientist, you like the fact that it's near linear time. But practically speaking, it, it performs very well. So if you choose a reasonable value like K100, it's about one millisecond per, per crystal. And in terms of completeness, PDDs are almost there. So others uh, in our group have worked on com more complete invariants or completely complete invariants. Um, PDD isn't quite complete. Um, there are some specific, um, we'd call measure zero, instant uh, measure zero, a measure zero part of the space, we'd say, uh, fails completeness, meaning basically uh, basically no crystals. Or another way of thinking of it is, if you have a crystal which fails the completeness test, any perturbation almost will, will make it pass. Um, and in nearly, in, in, so in nearly all cases, we have the completeness, it just fails in the suspect, uh, some certain specific spots of the space. Um, and where it is complete, which is nearly everywhere, at least everywhere practically, you can even reconstruct from this PDD, which should tell you everything you need to know, because if you can reconstruct the original structure, then the PDD has perfect information about the input. Right? So we've sacrificed some completeness for the simplicity, but um, that is the nature of this invariant. 
So here's a very simple example of how it's just quite a bit stronger than something even simpler, like just the list of distances between points, which is something that's actually used in crystallography. This is a really simple example, um, but it demonstrates how it's already stronger than something like that. This, uh, these two sets on the left, if you just look and count all the distances, list them all, it has the exact same collection of interpoint distances, but the PDDs are different because the PDD stores a little bit more information about the relative distribution of the points, like how they are arranged relative to each other. And then we can take this PDD, which is its own kind of coordinate or parameterization, and we can make it even simpler by taking a weighted average, which just gives a vector. And uh, these things, so we sacrifice even more completeness in a sense. Um, they don't have any provable degree of completeness, at least not yet, but um, still, Still, given that, we've only been able to construct counterexamples for completeness. So they're still very uh, information rich, but much, much simpler to compare. So we'll just run through some facts. Um, the distances between the AMD parameterization and the PDD is related. The AMD distance is always smaller. So you can actually kind of use the simpler AMDs as a filter before comparing by PDDs, if, if you wish to. We understand the um, asymptotic behavior of these things quite well. Um, the, it, uh, well, if you've ever heard of the Gauss circle problem, uh, this little mathematical thing with the square roots is a vast generalization of that statement. And um, eventually these things will converge, but the, the amount to which they diverge from this average value tells you things about how the sh structure is shaped. Like if there are big voids, then there'll be a big deviation from this expected value. Um, and you can actually extend this idea of PDD to include even more information, giving you actually an infinite zoo of, of different uh, invariants, but we will, we will leave that for another time. Um, so let's get into quickly some, some uh, applications, right? So uh, we managed to compare everything in the CSD, which are actually close to 1 million for us because we had to exclude things like disordered structures and uh, things with no geometry. But we managed to uncover five examples where two crystals had identical geometry, apparently both independently measured by different um, in a, at a different time, but the coordinates of the atoms, if when you pack the structure, it's literally uh, completely identical uh, structurally down to the last decimal place. And in these cases, the two atoms were swapped out for one another, and which is just a physical impossibility, right? I mean, uh, two differing atoms should affect the environment of those atoms. And if you measure something twice, even the same crystal twice, you shouldn't get the same list of coordinates. So these are really of a, a bit of extra um, um, investigation, right? And uh, here's what sort of my image for a suggested workflow of how you could incorporate this into curating a database. If you have a big database of SIFs, compute all the AMDs to get this big matrix. We've got one row for each crystal in the database and say a hundred columns. Um, and this doesn't take very long for the CSD. It takes about 15 minutes. Then we can take this big matrix and put it into this data structure called a KD tree. I won't talk too much about it, but the, the reason we make it is because it makes for fast nearest neighbor search. So on the bottom left here, when we get a new SIF, we can compute its AMD. We can match it against our existing KD tree to find if there are any matches. If we find nothing very similar, then just continue and um, with the rest of curation. But if we find something close or an ex very much an exact match, then inspect that. And, um, and that's, uh, that's essentially how this could be incorporated, right? Uh, and then some more applications, just some visualizations here for a bit of fun, really. So on the right, we have a, a minimum spanning tree, basically meaning each node is one crystal and nodes should be connected if they're similar or at least um, where there's, there are things that are similar, they will be close together on this tree and you can explore the tree and walk around it 
Um, and as you as you go from node to node, you should be a continuously exploring crystal space in some sense, as far as you're allowed by the data set. So um, the colors here mean uh, ref code families. If you're not familiar with the CSD, um, crystals which have been measured more than once go into groups. And uh, so something like sucrose at the bottom right, uh, at the bottom right here, has a big block of color because that's all sucrose. And we didn't we didn't find that. We we've discovered that um, just using our invariants and geometry, right? But they got naturally clustered together as they should. Then on the left here, there's a simple, very simple heat map of the first AMD coordinate. So average first bond length, think of it like that. And the average second, uh, sorry, the second AMD coordinate. So AMD one versus two. And we see that crystals sort of like to live in a specific hot spot, right? This is a very, very common first bond length if you draw the thing down. And uh, metal, more metal heavy structures like to live further up where the bonds tend to be larger or things are further away from each other. And this little blob which lives above the main hotspot um, is a specific kind of structure which has a small first bond length, but then much larger second bond lengths, metal carbonyls. And then I think the next slide is just for fun to see what it looks like. I give this, we can uh, take our AMDs, which are vectors representing a crystal, and we can apply dimensionality reduction and see what databases look like on a heat map. Like this one on the left is the whole CSD in one heat map. Um, but this is just AMD one versus two. So what if we take the whole AMD and dimensionality reduce it and plot that in a, in a heat map? Um, you can do this traditionally with k-mean, uh, is it not click k-means? Uh, I forget the one, but there are plenty of traditional dimensionality reductions, but I like to, I tried to use an AI because it wasn't too difficult. And here's what we got with four databases. So the top left is the CSD, and then on the top right is the ICSD, inorganic structures. Um, and then we have the COD crystallography open database, which is a mix of organic and inorganic. And in the bottom right, we have a materials project, which I think is mostly inorganic as well. Um, probably, I hope to have more information about the features of these things. What I do know for sure is that these dark lines are very highly symmetric cubic structures. This was just picked out by the AI, right? I asked the AI, take my AMDs and encode it into just two, um, two dimensions, an X and a Y. And it decided that things live on these uh, highly symmetric structures, which are same space groups live in, in this line. Right? And that's because distances in highly symmetric structures, I think tend to be proportional or highly related to each other. We only see the lines where we have inorganic structures in the databases and the CSD is a much more smooth blob, right? Um, and this is just a, low dimensional slice of what we've constructed here. So uh, that is roughly the end of the talk. If you want to try this, then here's some references. It's very simple to just write a few lines of Python to compare everything in a SIF or a few SIFs. Um, and it doesn't take very long, um, around a millisecond per structure. Um, you can get through millions of SIFs. Um, I'm sure people here have access to crazy computers that could do it much faster than even that, but um, there you go. Uh, references are at the bottom here. So that's uh, that's the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. Let us thank Dan for his presentation, please. Okay, uh, let me uh, stop recording. <clears throat>